two, one. In the early 1960s, a company called MB Associates came out with a revolutionary new type of gun that actually shoots rockets. We are now 500 years in the future with Buck Rogers. Yes, those young rocket rangers from the 1930s and 40s grew up, became engineers, and transported us all 500 years into the future, more or less. This was a big deal because it was like being able to buy a time-traveling DeLorean or a lightsaber today. All you needed was $250 for the pistol, or if you're really cool, for $300 you could buy the Gyrojet rocket carbine. Now $300 may not seem like a lot of money, but that's over $2400 in today's money. On top of that, the exotic rocket ammo made for these guns wasn't cheap either. For the price of one Gyrojet carbine, you could get six military surplus shootable grade German Lugers which used ammo that was only 10 cents around. In this video we have the once in a lifetime opportunity to shoot a gyrojet pistol and the even rarer gyrojet carbine. We'll be able to show you how these guns actually work and maybe we'll even clarify some of the rumors you've heard about these guns on the internet. Now at this point you may be asking yourself where the heck did we find not just one but two examples of gyrojet rocket guns and even rarer, an owner willing to let us shoot them. Well, it all began with a message on Facebook from a guy named Sean. And to this day, I have no idea why he contacted me. Maybe he contacted other channels and they just ignored him. He only mentioned that he heard about me from a comment I left from a couple years ago on a Forgotten Weapons video. And of course, I couldn't remember what I commented about, but that's what I said. But one week to the day after he initially contacted me, he drove the four plus hours through LA traffic to get to us, film for a few hours, and then head right back through that mess again. Now Sean was also a pilot in the US Navy and he flew turboprops and jets off nearly every aircraft carrier in the Pacific Fleet. And he has two gyrojets. Now he has his own YouTube channel called Really Great Gear and he will be posting a video of his own account of this gyrojet shoot, so be sure to check his channel out. The design of the guns was actually the easy part. The difficult part was designing a reliable, self-contained rocket round. The entire round is launched out of the gun, so the gun doesn't even have to have any means to eject a spent case. The barrel of the gun isn't even rifled. Spin stabilization is accomplished by a number of small jets or nozzles which are set at an angle and cause the round to spin at a very high rate. Like any rocket, these projectiles start out rather slow and then build up speed as the fuel is depleted. On the plus side, the guns are almost recoilless. The gyro jets are also much quieter than a normal gun. There's no loud boom. We didn't even wear hearing protection. The sound is pretty comparable to just lighting up a bottle rocket. Both the pistol and the carbine have a fixed magazine and have a maximum capacity of six rounds. The gun must not be cocked, the safety must be on, and then you press that lever to open that slide. And you load one round in at a time. You'll notice that the face of the hammer holds down the tip of the bullet in the magazine. The location of the hammer is in a very unusual spot. It's designed to swing backwards, strike the nose of the rocket round, and the primer strikes a fixed firing pin at the rear of the receiver. The next round that Danny is loading is a nickel-plated gyrojet. This round actually got the attention of author Mel Carpenter, who has the most comprehensive book on gyrojets and the other weird stuff that MBA made. Now Mel believes this round is an inert or dummy round and these were often used in the fancy limited edition display boxes that they sold. And according to Mel the brass colored one is zinc chromate and is even rarer. Now we forgot there was a slide assist on the magazine on the left so we fumbled around a little bit but you get the idea how this thing is loaded. 
And for our test, we're just loading one round at a time anyway. Now looking through the vent holes on the slide, you can actually see if there's a round in the chamber, if you can call it a chamber. The safety is labeled on and off. When the safety is slid up in the on position, a thin metal tab slides up between the round and the firing pin and prevents the gun from firing. It doesn't block the hammer or the trigger in any way, but it does prevent the slide from opening if it's in the off position. We'll be shooting at a distance of 10 yards or 30 feet or 9.1 meters. Since the rounds we're firing are quite scarce, we wanted at the very least to capture the spent rounds and recover them. Doug, our test dummy, is wearing two Kevlar vests and behind him is a ballistic fiberglass panel in case the rounds either pass through the Kevlar vest or fly just really wild. Three, two, one. 256. Two, one. Two, one. Danny was aiming at the orange dot on the vest and he hit Sean's camera mount for his GoPro. Here we see the hammer slamming back, hitting the nose of the gyrojet and setting it off. But we're also witnessing a malfunction. The primary purpose of the hammer is to, of course, set the round off. The secondary function that people don't think about is it creates a resistance, a slight delay, so that the rocket has time to start burning and get enough energy to leave the barrel at a decent velocity. The rocket is supposed to reset the hammer for the next shot, but in this shot it just rebounded and never reset. And for a gun that's supposed to have no recoil, look how much muzzle rise we had. Something went wrong. Now in defense of Danny, he did have a good solid two-handed grip. When the rocket ignites, we see a much larger than normal blast of flames coming out of the vent holes on the gun on the left side. And of course we see that intense muzzle rise. The rocket went high, hit the camera mount, went through the hat, went through Doug's head, went through the back of the hat, and then landed somewhere out in the field. Three days later, Danny went back out there with a metal detector and went through that plowed field and found the round. I can't believe you found it. <laughs> this spent round holds the clue of what happened. The primer blew out in this shot from pressure and created a fifth, much larger nozzle, which created all the undesired effects of this shot. As I mentioned before, the gyrojet guns themselves are pretty low tech, and there are some good videos out there by Life Size Potato and Forgotten Weapons that discuss that. The real rocket science went into developing the ammunition. In order to give you an idea of the size of these gyrojet rounds, let's compare it to a 50 BMG bullet. The gyrojet has more of a pistol bullet shape. It is shorter, but the diameter is almost exactly the same as a 50 BMG. And to be precise, it is one thousandths of an inch smaller. So yeah, in theory, I guess this would be possible. Though the rocket rounds were pretty big in size, the weight of an unfired round was only around 15.6 grams. After the round was fired, the weight dropped to 13.6 grams. This tells us the weight of the propellant was around 2 grams. The rocket round ammunition we were using was over 50 years old but in remarkably good condition. To protect the round from humidity and even direct immersion in water, a reddish lacquer-like substance called Humiseal was painted over all openings. So yes, the rounds are sealed tight as a drum, but the only question we can't really answer is whether or not the propellant itself breaks down, becomes less or even more potent over time. Okay, Sean, the owner, is going to take a shot now. Now, on a side note, we naturally expected Sean to take every single shot. They were his guns. It was his irreplaceable ammunition. Sean, on the other hand, expected us to take all the shots. And for some reason, he just wasn't interested, really, in shooting these things. And we had to talk him into taking this one shot. I think it went high. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, I missed. 
Now in this shot, the chronograph read about 150 feet per second, but by counting the frames, we determined that the exit velocity of this round was only around 75 feet per second. Now the pistol shot, with its blown out primer and kind of a out of control burn, was 256 feet per second. Since the rocket rounds accelerate progressively outside the barrel, we can only use these chronograph readings to compare one shot to the other, but it also gives you an idea how low the velocity is initially. Now in this shot, we have something that I would call a slow burn. It started out slow and it continued to burn almost all the way to the 10 yard mark. And you'll understand and be able to see what I'm talking about in the next couple shots where the rounds kind of go supernova at around five or six yards and then burn out. These variations in burn rates contribute to the unpredictability of the gyrojets. The gyrojet was too hot to touch, but it had enough energy to bury itself into the Kevlar vest. In our past tests, we've shot these vests with 45 ACP where they just bounced off the Kevlar onto the ground. Sean, you ready? I'm ready. You hit it. Cut the bottom of there the is a, a lot of heat that comes out of it. You hit it. Finally, in this shot, we see how the gyro jet is supposed to function. At only around five or six yards, the gyro jet's thrust suddenly increases dramatically as the remaining fuel burns off. The gyro jet has reached its maximum velocity, and right after that, it's cruising along and actually decelerating. Yes, this ammunition is over 50 years old, we have to consider that. But the gyro jets use a single grain of propellant and trying to get every single round to burn at the exact same rate is next to impossible. And I watched the piece of watermelon and I wasn't sure, but I thought it was a projectile. Well, that, that was a good eye, man. Yeah, I'm glad you're you, watching where did that. You aim? I was aiming uh, right here. With the scope? With the scope okay. a little to the right. And it, so it that one been, was. It hit pretty straight then? Yeah. Okay. And it could have been me as far as the elevation goes. There are many problems with trying to make a spin stabilized rocket projectile as accurate as a traditional bullet. Most of the acceleration of the gyrojet occurs outside the barrel. On top of that, you have a variable, unpredictable rate of spin. Even the most minute variations in the burn rate of the propellant will have dramatic effects on its ballistics. A traditional firearm isn't perfect either, but the results are much more predictable. All the variations we see occurring to the gyrojet outside the barrel have already been predetermined by the time the bullet leaves the barrel of a traditional gun. A traditional cartridge consists of a case, a primer, a bullet, and hundreds of small grains of powder. Even with the most modern type of powder, the burn rates of the individual grains may still vary. Some will burn fast, some will burn slow, but you have hundreds of them, which kind of averages them out to a predictable velocity and pressure and all that stuff. A traditional gun also uses rifling to spin the bullet to stabilize it. The twist rate of the rifling never changes, of course, but the spin rate of the bullet can vary depending on how fast the bullet's traveling down the barrel. Control the velocity and you automatically control the spin rate. And that can be simply done by using good quality ammunition that gives you consistent velocities shot after shot. Once the bullet leaves the barrel of a traditional gun, it's pretty much just coasting and decelerating, but there's still a lot of complicated physics involved just in that. Now let's take a look at the gyrojet round. It looks simple enough, doesn't it? The gyrojet round has a steel case, often plated in copper to prevent rust. They used a pistol primer, which was the only part they didn't have to make, and that was set into a steel plug, which contains the rocket nozzles. The drilling of the rocket ports was very tedious and required the utmost of precision. An employee would take one of the plugs, put it in an indexing turret, 
pretty much on a drill press, drill the tiny holes with a custom made taper drill bit. Then you would index the turret 90 degrees, drill the next hole, and so on. Since they're drilling at an angle, the drill bits would snap all the time. The later production gyro jets only have two holes because this process was just so tedious. The majority of the space inside the case of the gyro jet was taken up by the nitrocellulose propellant grain. These grains were extruded in one long stick and then trimmed to the approximate size, resized to get the proper outside diameter, and then put on a lathe to kind of form the correct shape to fit inside the case. The propellant grain was hollow and inside that they had what they called an igniter. Sometimes they used gun cotton, other times they used a uh, treated paper similar to flash paper. The primer alone would not ignite the propellant grain evenly. So the purpose of the igniter is to get the entire length, the entire inner surface of the propellant grain burning evenly. As the grain burns from the inside out, the surface area increases progressively as well as the thrust until the fuel is completely consumed. Alright, let's head out, take one more shot, and we'll see if we'll learn anything else about these fascinating rocket guns. And we got a calm point, so three, two, one. And This is a pretty textbook shot. I think everything went as well as possible. Many people have the idea that these things have a long delay, but when you're shooting it, you don't really notice any delay. It's like shooting an airsoft gun. Another idea people have is a gyro jet is non-lethal at close range, but what is close range? We see the rocket accelerate to maximum velocity in just a few yards in this shot. Yes, it does remind me of the Enterprise going into warp speed. <laughs> One internet rumor is that you could actually stop the bullet with your hand as it comes out of the barrel. While I think that is possible, I think you'd also risk breaking bones in your hand. But if you want to try the theory, be my guest. Now we did find the gyro jets very stable in flight. The spin rate was much higher with the gyro jets than any round we've ever seen flying at that velocity. Every round that we shot actually fired, so they are pretty reliable, but we can confirm that they are pretty inaccurate and unpredictable. Luckily we had the forethought to put that ballistic paneling behind the dummy. This actually gives us a lot of good information about how much energy the gyrojet had on impact. The gyrojet embedded itself very deeply and made a larger bulge in the back of the panel than a 9mm. The gyrojet is supposed to have the same energy as a 357 Magnum, but a 357 Magnum will go through that fiberglass panel. The gyrojet was very mushroomed, and if it was made out of a stronger material, a thicker steel, I think it would have passed through the fiberglass panel. Even though our ammunition was over 50 years old, our results were congruent with independent and military testing at the time when these guns and ammunition were still very new. Today the few gyro jets that were actually made and sold are in museums or private collections. Very few, if any, will ever be shot again. Again we want to thank Sean for his generosity and kindness for letting us not only film them but also shoot them. I would also like to thank Mel Carpenter, also known as Mr. Gyrojet, for his support and help in making this video. He has a fascinating book on the gyro jets and the other oddball stuff that MBA made. Melt did tell me that if you buy the book and request him to sign it, he'll happily do that. Our Indiegogo campaign for the posters is coming to an end soon. We have not reached 100% of our funding yet. So if you're on the fence or dragging your feet, I suggest buying it really soon before the campaign ends. And if we don't reach our goal, don't worry you will have all your money refunded. I hope that doesn't happen though. Okay, how much right. does it weigh now? Here we go quick, that's hot. 13.6, so it lost two, two grams of two. weight or so, at least two grams. Oh, that's one thing I was curious about. 
It was 15.6 or 8, because mm -hmm. they're all different. Interesting. The exciting part, still photography. But when else could you ever do this? Like you said, this is once in a lifetime for me. Oh yeah, for everybody, you know. Okay, <laughs> where did it hit, Danny? Yeah, so he hit here. If he'd have missed a little further, it would have hit this one. Yeah. But here it is right here, the, the best caught it. So far, I've been the most accurate, believe it or not, only because I was holding it to the right so far. Yeah. The wind, yeah. <laughs> you always blame the wind. All right, I'm not going to grab that dude because it is hot. Uh, our back, backstop's working so far. The vest caught it. The fiberglass panel caught it. <laughs> I'm glad we put that panel there. My goodness. to your left there, Jeff. So steer right where you guys are. Flip this way? No, stay where you are. Oh. That is cool. Yeah, you felt the hot blast over your hands, right? Or didn't I wasn't really paying attention. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I noticed that it was like like a light up a barbecue and a delayed ignition. It's, you know, it's kinda like that. Any hotter it burned the hairs off your hands. Did you guys get whatever pictures you wanted to get with I us? think so. 